from what I was told, that was supposed to be me. But I had unfortunately gotten myself into trouble. Mm. And so it didn't happen. Hey, it's Chris. Thank you for joining me for this conversation with my fellow Chris, Chris Masters. Hard to believe it's been, wow, it's been almost three years since our first interview, which you can check out right up there. But this interview is brought to you by The Ridge Wallet. Because this right here, wow, magic how that happened, is my old wallet. It's big, it's floppy, it's flimsy. It is, well, it's just big, okay? And this is my new wallet, The Ridge Wallet. Look at the difference in size here. Oh my gosh, look at that. Let's get some close-ups of that. I mean, I get so many compliments on this because it's light, it's sleek, it's industrial. This is a front pocket wallet, so you don't have that big back pocket bulge anymore, especially when you sit down and you're sitting like lopsided because you got the big George Costanza wallet that holds up to 12 cards. Plus you got room for cash on the back here, which for me is a total of $2 and there's over 30 different colors and styles to choose from. The one I've been showing you here is the carbon fiber. But I think the fact that they have more than 40,000 five-star reviews, including mine, really says it all. So because they're sponsoring today's video and because I know that you need a much better wallet than that one that you currently use, Ridge is gonna give you 10% off by clicking that link down in the description, ridge.com slash CVV, or just use the code CVV. Again, it's ridge.com slash CVV. I mean, look at this, guys, come on. Look at the difference. Look at that. All right, it's happening. Chris and Chris here, although only one of us is the masterpiece, and that's Chris Masters. So thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, good to be on with you again, man. Uh, hopefully uh, last time I wasn't really as aware of you last time, but uh, you did had a great interview. And then I saw all the uh, different people you've interviewed. It's amazing, man. Uh, you're a cool dude. So I'm glad to uh, be on with you again, man. Dude, that was three years ago that we did that first interview. Can you believe that? No. Time flies. I can't. And in that time, you and I have traveled together to a wrestling show, traveled back from that wrestling show. And the whole time in the airport, we're like, we got to do this thing again. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I've been looking forward to uh, coming back on with you. And yeah, man, I think it has felt like a long time. But then again, you know, this last year of the pandemic has felt like multiple years, really, because we've all been through so much. So I guess that's part of it, right? It, in some ways, it's felt like multiple years. And in other ways, it feels like, I don't know, like nothing's happened this year. So you're like, oh, yeah, I guess the last time I saw you was six months ago, which also might have felt like six years ago or six days ago. I'm not sure. Totally, totally. But a lot's happened since then. You're, uh, you're now crushing it in NWA. You're the national champion right now. So congratulations. Thanks, man. Thanks. Yeah, it's been, uh, it's been a lot of fun. It's been good to get back to work. And uh, it's been good to work for a company like NWA, which, uh, you know, I've been watching them uh, over the last few years and just seeing... Uh, you know, I just, I love the whole idea of what they're doing. You know what I mean? I, it's kind of, it's got an old school feel to it. You know, the studio wrestling feel, feel, but, um, you know, I'm a fan of, uh, that wrestling, you know, the storytelling of that era and, you know, kind of everything it represented. And, uh, uh, I just, I really like what they're doing and I like what we're doing collectively in the collective mindset of NWA. It works really well for you because your character feels like an old school heel. <laughs> yeah 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 and that's the wrestling i grew up on you know there's a lot of people i mean wrestling has certainly evolved in a lot of ways but i think there's certain things should, that should stay the same you know what i mean in terms of you know the selling the storytelling you know and all that stuff with the business but uh you know it's not to say i don't love some of the new style today too you know these these uh the young guys are very innovative and doing things in high spots that to which we thought we'd never see but uh you know I, I i do like that old school feel and you know i feel like even though we have an old school feel i feel like nwa uh when you watch it uh you know the guys still look contemporary to me have you always been jacked like were you a jacked teenager uh <laughs> no no actually uh, i was really skinny growing up really i was a thin as a rail man like uh my mom and my cousin used to joke around and call me the number one 
because I was just so, <laughs> yeah. but, um, you know, I started working out when I was like 15 years old. Uh, and once I start decided I wanted to become a pro wrestler, it seemed like a logical step. So, um, that was my, uh, my start into working out. Like I even had a first period weight, weight training class in the 10th grade that I didn't do anything in, you know, like I just, I wasn't in that mind, that mind space yet, but then it was a short time after that, you know, I always had loved wrestling. I mean, wrestling was always my number one love and I decided that I wanted to seriously pursue it. So then working out became like, you know, the obvious step. And so I took that on as a hobby and started uh, doing it obsessively. But look, man, I started working out when I was 15 as well. And I don't look like you. Uh, well, you know, I got to thank my dad and mom for those genetics, man. I mean, honestly, that's a, a big part of it. It's not to say uh, you personally couldn't get built. I'm sure you could. I don't know exactly what you were doing. But, you know, genetics really kind of determine your, uh, you know, your potential. You know what I mean? In terms of like, you know, what type of size or build and all that stuff you're going to have. So it helps out, you know, uh, you know, I was always a pretty tall guy, you know, at least, you know, reasonably tall. I mean, I'm six four now, but I was, you know, pretty tall throughout my whole uh, growing up. And, uh, you know, luckily I had broad shoulders too. So that um, kind of helps, you know, that whole look. So were you the guy that like, after six months of working out, you were already like putting on some serious mass? Uh, I put on, you know, like in my traps and biceps, like okay. specifically, you know Sounds what I mean? Like a Those, high school workout to me. <laughs> Well, they, you know, they were just the first thing that responded. I mean, maybe I was, I guess I was maybe doing a little bit too much of curls and upright rows and stuff like that. But, um, you know, that was kind of the first thing, you know what I mean? That kind of responded to me. Like I always kind of had a, you know, bicep peak. So, um, yeah, man, but it was all just a part of, you know, I never, you know, a lot of people always thought I was a bodybuilder, you know, turned wrestler. And I've already retold this a million times in a million different interviews, but it was never, that was never the case. I took a bodybuilding because of my love for pro wrestling and wanting to get into pro wrestling. Which is an interesting thing because you look at a lot of wrestlers now and unfortunately there's a lot of wrestlers that don't look like they've ever worked out. And, you know, maybe that works for them and their character, but it's so interesting to look at you who went, okay, I grew up watching wrestling. I know what wrestlers look like. So the first steps for me are get in shape to look like a wrestler. It's funny you say that, you know, I was joking around the other day because I went over, you know, when I went to the NWA tapings, there was, uh, I got picked up at the airport and there was somebody who got picked up with me that I hadn't met before or anything like that. I didn't know who it was. And it was uh, this guy who comes down and he's only about, he's like five foot 10, maybe about a buck 50 or something like that. And the, the business has changed so much that I just assumed, hey, maybe this is some wrestler I haven't met or maybe this uh, really popular indie wrestler or anything. But then I, I come to find out like later that night that, oh, no, he's just a cameraman so he's a photographer so um you know it, that just kind of goes into what you were saying yeah the business has changed a lot and i'm not disparaging um you know i uh, you know there's always gonna be a place for big guys in wrestling you know what i mean it's nice to see um guys who aren't necessarily hulk hogan or something like that get opportunities but um you still want to have guys that look like grown men you know what i mean so you know i kind of fall on both sides of that but uh, like growing up i was you know, I loved the Ultimate Warrior when I first started watching wrestling. But, you know, as time went on, I really kind of appre started appreciating not necessarily the biggest guys in wrestling, but, you know, like the Bret Hart's and Shawn Michaels and Kurt Henning and, the you know, the guys who weren't necessarily the they're, – they're not small guys by any means, but yeah. they weren't like the uh, giants of professional wrestling. When you go to a locker room now, you're probably one of the biggest guys in the locker room easily, right? Uh, well, on indie wrestling shows, but uh, funny enough, I did a show in Florida just about a week and a half ago. I was in Florida, yeah, actually. Um, and um, I wrestled a guy who was not only uh, taller than me, but, you know, about four feet wide. He was about 450 pounds or something like that. So it was one of the those rare occasions where, um, you know, somebody was much bigger than me. So it kind of uh, it's kind of fun for me, though, to have people we get to work with people like that because it's a completely different style of match, at least for me. You know, I'm not the big guy imposing my will on him as much as he is on me. You know, you talk about growing up watching wrestling and I love these throwbacks that you put on Instagram, like you with Stone Cold Steve Austin, you with <laughs> China. Like these are such great photos. And you had like this long stringy hair. Like 
it, it's just such a great throwback that these are the people that you admired and then you ended up working with them. Yeah, it you know, it blows my mind, man. Like I was the biggest fan, the biggest mark you could ever imagine, man. Like I am like to be, you know, when I first got called up to WWE and I was sharing the locker room with all guys I grew up watching, you know what I mean? It was just so, uh, it was intimidating. It was super intimidating, man. Cause you know, I respected everybody. Like when I was a wrestling fan, uh, you talked about some of those pictures. Like I didn't care who I met. I wanted to meet everybody. You know what I mean? Like, like HBK was my favorite, like obviously, but like, I just, I respect everybody. I just looked up to them so much and what they did. And I was like, you know, I just thought the world of uh, professional wrestling and pro wrestlers. And um, I had a lot of cool experiences growing up between, um, you know, me and my buddy used to sneak backstage at WWE house shows all the time. I got to meet everybody. That's where a lot of those pictures came from is us sneaking backstage at the Arrowhead Pond of Anaheim out there. And, uh, you know, we would just, we would try to be as inconspicuous as possible. We eventually smartened up and stopped wearing wrestling shirts so that they wouldn't <laughs> identify us right away. And I, you know, I joked with Dave Hebner about it all the time because uh, Dave Hebner would always kind of find us and kick us out. So, you know, it was kind of funny when I eventually came to work and I was actually employed with World Wrestling Entertainment. And then I saw Dave and, you know, I kind of reminded him of all the times. He, obviously, I looked nothing like I did at that point. So he, didn't necessarily like look at me and be like, oh, you're that guy. But I told him, like, yeah, you used to kick us out all the time from uh, back. We used to try everything in our power to avoid him at all costs. How does, how does one sneak into a WWE house show? Well, we didn't sneak in. We bought a ticket to a house okay. show. One of, my, one of my buddies found this service elevator in the Arrowhead Pond. He found <laughs> this door that led to a service elevator, and the service elevator would take you basically right to the uh, backstage parking lot. And so we would get out there and we would kind of, you know, at first we would go backstage and like, I just remember uh, I was such a fan at that point. It was so funny that um, I saw uh, Bret Hart and Sean within like five feet of each other. And I was like, I was so, I couldn't believe it. I was like borderline, like borderline sprinting to go meet these guys. But I also in my head, I was thinking like, these guys hate each other. Like, how are they within you know, five feet of each other or whatever. So, um, but then, you know, we'd be, you know, we'd be kicked out. Of, so we would just kind of, at a certain point, we would go downstairs and then we would just wait in the parking lot instead and not go backstage and just try to get them as they were leaving it. But we met like a ton of people like that, man. I think I have a picture with Vince McMahon. You saw the one with Stone Cold. I mean, we met everybody. When you first met Vince as a wrestler, he must have just looked at your physique and went, Phew. This guy this is exactly what I'm looking for. Oh, especially, I, I think, especially at, at that time compared yeah. to even now. Uh, I, I'll say this I know that um, I reminded Vince a lot of Paul Orndorff. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if we had talked about this already before, but sometimes I forget to bring it up. But I reminded Vince a lot of Mr. Wonderful. So uh, he, they really had me watching a lot of him. And even they even had me work with Paul Orndorff. Uh, the weekend of WrestleMania 21, when it was out there in LA, uh, Paul was there obviously. And they had me work out in the ring with him a couple of times, which was, you know, very interesting. So when you're growing up is the plan, I'm going to be a wrestler and that's it. There's no backup plan. Yeah. I mean, it was, and you know, I talk to kids all the time and I tell them, you know, it's funny you bring this up because, uh, yeah, that was the plan. And I was like, I don't know. I had this, I just, I felt, like, this is my passion. This is what I'm pursuing. And I went all in. And man, I started working because I needed to get a job to buy supplements and stuff like that. And I didn't even end up finishing high school, which fast forward to now, I'm actually, you know, throughout this pandemic, I've been working on my GED just because I figured, wow. you know, there's a lot of things I didn't get done in my life because I fast tracked wrestling so much. Like I wanted to get into it as young as possible, which I did, you know, I got signed at 19 and all that, but you know, I neglected a lot of things. So, um, you know, now I'm even going back and yeah, I'm getting my GED and, and stuff like that, just because these are valuable, valuable information to know and skills and whatnot. And, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I forgot I'm going on kind of like a rant on this, but how do we, uh, how do we get Basically on this? saying you had no backup plan? Yeah. Oh, no back. Yeah. No backup plan. Yeah. I just went all in into professional wrestling. And, you know, I tell kids all the time, like in any who might be listening to this, uh, 
you know, when you have a dream or something like that, that's great. And uh, pursue it, of course. But like, in my case, I was too much of a rush to get there. You know what I mean? Like, I, mm -hmm. if I could go back, I would have just went through the process, finished school, maybe even, um, you know, took a couple college courses, but essentially just enough time for me to mature so that I wasn't, you know, making, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars at the age of 20 and just completely irresponsible and not know how to handle it. You know, I just, you know, when you do something like that, I mean, it's not that you 100% need that stuff, but they're valuable life skills that um, I missed out on because I was so such in a rush to pursue that dream. So uh, that's kind of my advice to any young people who are trying to get into wrestling. Not that they ask for it, but I'm just saying if you're a potential pro wrestler and you want to get into it, cool, do it and, you know, go to a school and, you know, be responsible, but just, you know, do what you got to do first, you know, finish school and all that stuff. I just can't imagine having that conversation with my parents. I can't imagine at 16 going, you know what? I'm going to drop out of high school so I can be a pro wrestler. They'd be like, Christopher, because they call me Christopher. They'd be like, Christopher, same for you. This is ridiculous. You're staying in school. How did that conversation go with your parents? I, well, you know, it was only my mom around at that point. I didn't meet my dad until much later. So I'm, I'm assuming probably if my dad was in the picture, it might have went very different because of uh, he values education very highly. But, um, you know, it, it wasn't that I just decided to stop going to school, man. What it was is uh, I started working. And I was working like I was pretty much I was doing the schedule where I was going to school uh, from eight to three. And then I was working from 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. So I go pretty much straight to work because I needed to make money for uh, this stuff. You know, we didn't have a lot of money. And then I would go to the gym from 10 p.m. to 12 p.m. at night. So you, you can imagine my days were very full and I wasn't making time for homework. I was missing days. And, you know, so school suffered and uh, it wasn't by me just deciding not to go it was just I was working and you know the gym like it was just I was spread very thin priorities you had different priorities what kind of job were you working at the time oh my gosh you're gonna kick out of this um like smoothie a smoothie shop man I worked at um <laughs> my first kind of job job was at this place called Hollywood Smoothies over there in LA uh um, and then I ended up going to work at Jamba Juice, which is a popular joint. But everybody knows about Jamba course, Juice, I uh, think, now. They headhunted you. The other smoothie shop couldn't pay you as, not, as exactly. much as Jamba Juice. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, they signed me. They signed <laughs> me up, Jamba Juice. And then they uh, promoted me to a main event. Uh, what is it? Shift leading position. They actually did. I, I got promoted within there. And then. You know, I worked, did that, and then I eventually ended up working at, uh, you know, a couple other jobs, like YMCA as a trainer, and then for Muscle Mag International, which actually you would be familiar with being a, a Canada guy. Uh, yeah, Muscle Mag had a store over in Venice, Venice Beach area. So that was the last job, like job job I actually held because I got um, signed to pro wrestling while I was working there, and I still have yet to enter the real workforce since then. Well, you know, you have those skills. You could always go back to Jamba Juice if you need to. <laughs> well, you know, the, the sad thing is, is I mean, you know, I hear when I hear about the minimum wage and it's still the same minimum wage from when I was in the workforce, that's a little like, wow, oh my gosh. You know what I mean? Like, how are people surviving? And um, I mean, that's a whole nother topic to get into. Nobody wants to hear about it on uh, our show, but um, it's uh, crazy. When did you first realize that you were making strides in wrestling and like you were really starting to get noticed? Uh, you know, when I came back, you know, I, I started training at 16 and I got injured. I fractured my ankle. So I took a couple of years off and just focused on, uh, you know, maturing and weight training and that stuff. And then when I came back pretty much immediately, cause, uh, when I came back, I came back in great shape and, uh, I was going to UPW in California, which is run by Rick Bassman and, you know, WWE keep, you know, it was basically like the West coast developmental territory by that. I know where, so, that's where Cena got discovered, right? Yeah. And, you know, see the Cena thing, Cena and me go back to that previous time. I was just talking about, you know, when I started at 16, Cena started the, around the same time as me, uh, maybe even the same day. And then we were training for a, few months and then I ended up injuring myself and I had to have surgery on my ankle and so then I had uh you know a good 
took a couple of years off and then came back and then Cena went on his way. Obviously a short time after that, he went to OVW and then he was on WWE and, you know, I was just kind of a couple of years behind him. So we're talking, you're like 18 at this time. When I came back. Yeah. 18. Uh, I think. Yeah. So I, I started, so I took a couple of years off, came back at 18, started training again and got signed by the time I was about 19. So it happened real quick. Yeah, like, and you talk about, like, missing out on, like, some of that formidable time when you were young, but at the same time, when this is happening, and you're 19 years old and being offered a WWE contract, I mean, you feel like you've made it at that point. Yeah, it's the ultimate. I mean, that's, you know, um, when you, anybody who chooses, you know, one of the things I love that, that I get, you know, Obviously, I would have liked to do a lot more and still would like to do a lot more in the business. But um, one thing that always kind of keeps me is kind of fun to hear is when people from that I grew up with and stuff like that are always like so complimentary over the fact that like you did exactly what you said you were going to do. You know what I mean? And there's there's something about that when somebody because anybody can say they're going to do anything. But when you see somebody follow through and it's from a young age or something like that, it's uh, and especially when it's your dream. You know what I mean? When you follow your dream, I mean, that's the kind of stuff that really inspires people. And uh, it was really cool. I mean, you said that you weren't a bodybuilder. It was kind of like a byproduct of being a pro wrestler. When you got that size, did you feel like you had to keep that size? Um, Only after I came out, you know, when I came back one point in, um, so I, I had to go to rehab in my first WWE run. And uh, when I came out of rehab, I was I was lighter, you know, because I was basically, everybody thought I was doing the rehab for, uh, they just assumed because of the character it was for like steroids, but it wasn't, you know what I mean? It was I had a prescription pill issue, which, you know, obviously a lot of people have had in the business, but um. So, but then when I was in rehab, you know, I would wake up every morning and I would go on this like beautiful two mile run. So I'd wake up every morning and I'd start with a run. And, but for someone like me, like when I do stuff like that, like I just, basically I was doing that every day to keep my sanity and I wasn't stepping on a scale. And by the time I left that place, I had lost, you know, a good 15 to 20 pounds. So I came back, when I came back from that, I was much slimmer and um, I felt, you know, it was I didn't have even really thought about it because I was battling uh, deeper issues, obviously, if I was in sure. rehab, you know what I mean? So I wasn't thinking about that. But then when I came back to WWE and, you know, I heard a little bit of chatter about it, I was like, then I felt a little pressure. I'm like, oh, you know, I should, I got to put on, you know, I got to go up and at least like try maybe put on 10 pounds or just eat a little more or whatever. Cause uh, you know, the reaction was enough for me to kind of be like, whoa. Yeah. I think that a lot of people just went, oh, he was on steroids before, he's now not on steroids. This is the difference. That's the, yeah, and that's the, you know what? I can't even fault them for that because, uh, you know, if I was just a casual viewer or somebody not really kind of hearing these interviews or something like that, that's probably just what you'd assume. Like, oh, he had to go to rehab. It must've been for steroids. And then when you see he comes back and he's he's lighter, it it just makes sense. And so, uh, but that wasn't the case. It just, it, it just wasn't really, you know? I, I think when people, when, when you have the size that you had and then you fail a wellness policy test, I think people go, oh, well, it's obvious what's happening here. Mm-hmm. What was yeah. it that you actually had a problem with? Which painkiller? Uh, you know, just opiates in general. And, you know, you hear a lot about this now because of Hollywood, as you know, just interviewing the people you do and pro wrestling, obviously. Sure. And, uh, you know, the beautiful thing is though, when you look at the business now that they really have done a good job of washing that part. Like we've kind of turned the page on that at least a bit, you know what I mean? So um, for me, yeah, it was opiates and muscle relaxers, you know, like I had gotten various injuries, like my eardrum got ruptured and it, I remember I was in tremendous pain from it. This was an OVW. And uh, I had to eventually go into the emergency because I couldn't sleep and my ear was ringing. And then they uh, wrote me, the doctor there wrote me a script for painkillers. And then, uh, you know, just various instances of either injuries or uh, and you take them and then eventually, you know, it becomes 
more of a dependency, you know what I mean? Than, than even something, you know what I mean? And especially when you have the accessibility, like, so for me, I went, I had unlimited access to it and I was making a lot of money. So it kind of like, you know, it kind of spiraled and it became a big issue for me, you know, gradually with time, it didn't happen overnight, but it started with these little instances. Like I just pointed out to you, like the eardrum rupture and whatever else, and then eventually access and then money. And, you know, I have an addictive personality when it comes to stuff like that. So it it pretty much, uh, yeah, it kind of took control of me for a good while there. But I'm, you know, I, I'm lucky. I'm. I always feel lucky that I survived because, I mean, I literally, you know, some people might not believe this, but I mean, I shouldn't be here. I was taking numbers that were astronomical, and uh, I survived it. So it's really, uh, you know, I'm lucky. Yeah, you hear stories like Kurt Angle will talk about taking like a fist full of painkillers to get out of bed. Is that what we're talking about? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah, I was right. That's what I was thinking about, because I've heard a lot of Kurt stuff recently. And I know, you know, I was right up there. I don't know. I didn't have the injuries that Kurt had. Let me clarify that by all sure. means. So he, he had much more justification for his issue. But like I was kind of right up there with Kurt in terms of how much I was taking. You know what I mean? And it just gradually got there. And, you know, I was still functional. But, um, you know, it's just sad because even when I I'll look back, and there's a lot of memories from that time frame that I don't really have. I don't really have a lot of mem- good memories. You know, a lot of stuff is cloudy from back mm-hmm. in that time frame. And I don't know if that's because of my, uh, you know, going through that battle and just not, you know, you don't have clarity. Like, you know, sometimes people will ask me about stuff in the past. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff I just won't remember. I don't know if it's because of that, but it feels like there is a lot of memories that have been either you know, not retained or whatever, because of pot potentially that. How much of that is from pills and how much is from concussions? Well, that, that yeah, that's the other thing. I mean, you know, who knows, you know, I'm not completely sure. I mean, I've definitely been hit in the head a few times and had some pretty nasty concussions. So I, it's hard to say, you know what I mean? If how much or how little my brain is functional from that, like, you know, there's a lot of guys who've had it a lot worse than I have, you know what I mean? In terms of getting hit in the head with chairs and various things. So, uh, you know, that's why I kind of, you know, even I didn't feel right about entering that, you know, that whole concussion suit with WWE. It's like, I don't know, that just, to me, it seemed like, you know, I'm not, you know, they didn't force me to do anything. You know what I mean? Like we kind of knew what this is getting into it. And I don't know, I just didn't feel like that was anything I wanted to be a part of. At what point did you realize, oh my God, I think I've got a problem with pills. Was there something that pushed you over the edge? Uh, or was it, it failing took a while. the test? No, it, it took a while because, you know, like WWE had an intervention with me. And, but, oh you God. know, <laughs> yeah, they did. I mean, and they, they, that's why, that's why I essentially had to go to rehab, you know what I mean? But I think it wasn't, it wasn't really until I got released. And then I would, I think it, I actually remember being in Europe for some independent tour. It was, uh, I forgot the name. It was, I think it was American rampage is what it was called. And I don't know. I just kind of had this moment where I looked in the mirror and I had thought about, you know, everything I had lost up until that point and, you know, kind of where it potentially got derailed and, um, I think that was kind of my moment. And, and this was after already going to rehab and stuff like that. You know what I mean? So it goes to show you when you're an addict, how like you, you can even go as far as you can go into rehab and all that stuff, but you really, you know, you have to really believe it yourself and know that you have a problem. And sometimes you'll go into that stuff, not with that understanding and, you know, maybe it won't work for you, which is why, you know, rehab doesn't work. I don't know what the statistic is, but they say it doesn't work for a huge percentage of people. And that's probably because a lot of those people going in or were either forced to, or they, uh, they weren't really, they were, they didn't accept that they had a problem yet. They were still in the middle of it. You know what I mean? So sometimes you got to lose and you got to lose and you got to lose some more until you finally have that moment where you're like, Oh my gosh, you know what I mean? Like, what is, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, you're right. I think you have to realize that you want to get help or else you're not going to be able to get help. Yeah, totally. Totally. So when we look at you getting signed to WWE at 
19. I mean, you've hit, that's the pinnacle. Things are great. And you're on a fast track. Like you're working with some of the biggest stars in the industry. You're in title matches. At what point is it, you know, is it a, is it a week in? Is it a month in? Is it six months in? Do you go, oh my God, like I, I can't believe I'm in these types of storylines. Um, you know, I'd have to point it out to, it all kind of started because with me, they were just building me. Like when I first got there, it was, uh, you know, it was kind of a lot of uh, enhancement matches. There's a lot of master lock challenges. It was a lot of building that finish. And my first real program was, I coincidentally was against, you know, Shawn Michaels, the guy who I'd grown up idolizing. So, and it was kind of from that point that everything kind of started for me because I started working with Shawn. Then, you know, when you work with somebody, you obviously you take that to the house shows. And then like, even for the rest of that year, I was working tag matches against, uh, you know, like teaming with Hunter against Sean and Flair or Sean and Big, me teaming with Edge against uh, Sean and Big Show, you know, just various different tag matches like that. And um, it was kind of around that time I would be involved in some of those matches and I would just see the Nate entering the ring with his robe, you know, all, you know, just like sparkling and I would just be outside the ring, giving him the ring for his entrance. And then, you know, HBK would coming out and I would just, you know, you'd have those moments where the fan in you is almost kind of like got goosebumps, but, you know, and, but it's funny because it's like a tip for tat with the performer, because, you know, you have that moment, but then, you know, as you know, action is getting closer, you got to kind of snap out of it because you know, you want these guys respect and you want to put on a good match with them. So you kind of have to get over that feeling so that you can, uh, you know, really go in there and perform and do it to the best of your ability. Because, I mean, if I approach the match from that headspace, I mean, you know, I would be far too gentle with both of them. You know, <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, man, that was, I think that was kind of the moments uh, right after starting to work with him and then working you know, the house shows, as you know, we, we'd work all over the world, man. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? It was just uh, four nights a week, uh, US, Europe, Australia, everything. In your debut match, you famously or infamously broke Stevie Richards' nose. At what point did you realize you had broken his nose? Oh my gosh, that was terrible. Um. <laughs> Man, I don't know what moment it was. I think I realized right away because it was a miscue big time. Like I was, you know, I was aiming to come across the top of the chest and I hit him right in the face, man. And um, oh, it, was, it was just awful. It was awful. I mean, it's the only time I've ever injured anybody, luckily. And it, But it was really traumatizing. You know, Stevie was very angry and justifiably so uh, backstage. And um, I think I just knew right away that I, I probably... Um, hurt him and it was just it was a tough day all around because i mean i've told this story a million times so i might not go too deep into it unless you ended up wanting to but i got food poisoning the day before from eating a turkey wrap at a gas station in the middle of nowhere so like not that that has anything to do with necessarily breaking stevie's face but it was just a rough day because i was as sick as i've ever been that day throwing up i couldn't hold down a drop of water i was you know just kind of laid out on the doctor's table all day and then on top of it, I go out there, you know, I try to muster the energy for this big debut. And, uh, you know, I psych myself out and, um, you know, try to do as good as possible. But then, you, yeah, I end up nailing him right in the face with that Polish hammer, man. And I broke his nose. I broke his um, the eye bone. And, um, yeah, it really just it really sucked. You know, I, I still apologize to him to him uh, for it this day. And uh I don't know. I've just, I've, I've always kind of held it as a badge of honor. The fact that like I did injure Stevie that day really bad, but I made a promise to myself from that step, from that point that like, Hey, you know, that was it. You can't injure nobody from this point mm -hmm. on. You've already like, you know, that's it. That's, you know what I mean? So, um, and luckily to this day, I, that that's been the only injury that I've personally caused. Not, not to say, Somebody hasn't gotten hurt in the ring under some kind of circumstances while I was in there, but it wasn't uh, directly related to anything I did to them. So, like, I kind of hold that as a badge of honor, and, uh, you know, I just never want to do that to anybody again. 
Is the silver lining to getting food poisoning the fact that you look extra shredded when you go out under those lights? <laughs> that's that's a one way to look at it. But the problem with that was is I was more uh, deflated than anything because I had lost so much weight because I was throwing up that morning too. Like I, I, I went downstairs to have breakfast just like normal and like I took one bite of it and I was done. I couldn't eat. And then I just remember I was with Michael Bucci, Nova, and we, would, we went over to the tanning salon and somewhere, I think right before I went to tanning salon, man, I just started hurling. Mm -hmm. And so what happened was is what you're saying might be true, but I think more so that by the time I actually did you, I had lost 10 pounds and I felt like it actually kind of deflated me a little bit. Like maybe I'm the only one to notice. I, I don't know, but like, you know, I think I would have looked better essentially if I hadn't been like that sick all day. You know what I mean? Cause I, already, I, I, I remember watching your debut live and going, Oh my God, that guy's massive. Like you had, uh, you, I mean, seriously, you're one of the like all time body guys when you think about it. <laughs> well, that's cool. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know. Again, I, I feel like I lost 10 pounds. So like for me, I rather have been able to eat normally and all that. And I wasn't as worried about because I, I always stayed pretty lean. You know what I mean? So for me, it was more like, oh, I went from 260 to 250 in one day and I had to debut like that. So was there ever a point where you thought, I'm too sick to wrestle. Did anyone ever try no. to talk you out of it? You know, it's your debut. Like, that's the thing. Like, think about it. I think you're a lifelong wrestling fan, too. I mean, yeah. just anybody who's a lot, you know, loves, breathes, eats, sleeps pro wrestling. I mean, just imagine that it's your debut and it, you're sick. It's just, it doesn't even come to mind. Like, you just know you have to. So, um, I just remember it being a tough day, man. I was drinking gin. The only thing I could keep down was a little bit of ginger tea all day. Like I was, you know, drinking a little bit of that and it would give me a little bit of relief where I'd feel a little better. But it's just, you know how pro wrestling is, man. It's just, it's not even, it's not like other things. Like no matter what, you've got to get yourself out there and do it. So um, I don't think it crossed my mind. I think probably in my head, I wish it could have been an option, but like, you know, this has been built up. They had been running vignettes for weeks. And then, you know, they had circled that day. They had even said it. You know what I mean? This is the night. So you just know there's there's no way around that. I, I, that's amazing that you were able to have that kind of performance when you were feeling as sick as you were feeling. Man, when you look at your career, you had, you had a huge push. And I'm curious to know if you were ever considered to win the title. Uh, yeah, I think early on, I mean, uh, you know, I was considered for a lot of stuff. I mean, I was considered, I was supposed to win the Intercontinental title, but then the, the, uh, the intervention we talked about earlier had happened. So then it didn't happen. And, uh, I know the specific night and everything, uh, I was supposed to win the tag titles with Carly at that WrestleMania where we worked big show and came, but then that got switched the day of because of a change of plans, you know, which happens. That's one thing you learn about pro wrestling is you learn to never count your chickens before they hatch type of thing. It's like, until something actually happens, you can't wonder count on it. It's just, you know, you learn that time and time again. But, um, you know, there was even a pre tape shot with Vince and me where he was alluding to me being potentially the youngest WWE champion of all time. And this was even after Randy had won it. And, uh, I know that they were considering Cena and me for an angle. Like, I think probably looking back that if anything, Cena might have shot that down. Like, I don't think Cena was too happy working with me around that time frame. But um, I don't why, know that. Why would sure. he not be happy working with you? Oh, I, you know, like, I, I could have good matches with, with uh, you know, I had good matches with HBK. But I don't know. Cena felt like he had to leave me. You know what I mean? That's probably because I was... I was new and stuff like that, but, um, you know, he just felt like he had to lead me and it, it, I don't know, it was just a little more difficult for us, uh, ring chemistry wise, I guess, you know what I mean? But, um, I don't even know that for sure. You know what I mean? But, um, cause I just know I, I was working a lot with Shawn Michaels and I was working a lot with John Cena in terms of the house shows and like, you know, Shawn was an easier match for me to have, but then again, Shawn had, how many years of experience, you know what I mean? And, it, yeah. and as over as John Cena was, uh, you know, he had 
started in the business. You know, we had essentially started in the business around the same time together. So I think that might have kind of been, you know, although I had gotten hurt and then he had gone the WWE and all that much before me, I think, you know, that might have been um, part of it. You know what I mean? Like the, uh, you know, there wasn't a guy with Shawn Michaels experience in the ring type of thing. Yeah, I, I think one of the biggest things when people bring up your name is missed opportunity. And a lot of fans feel like there was a lot of missed opportunities with you. Do you feel like there were missed opportunities? Uh, yeah, but I mean, it's not anybody's, completely anybody's fault. You know what I mean? Like you could blame WWE or whatever, like, like some people do. But I mean, a lot of that is on me too. You know what I mean? So there were a lot of things, whether it be from uh from both sides that uh you know where that kind of just didn't didn't happen and uh you know it's unfortunate but you know i can't always just live in regret over well, what potentially could have been or anything like that you know i just look back on a lot of the memories at this point in my life and i'm very grateful to have been you know in the wwe at that point you know what i mean like to be a part of the ruthless aggression era and and being able to work with a lot of, uh, like we talked about before, a lot of guys that, you know, that were eventually obviously going to retire. And I was able to catch them before that. Cause you know, it'll never be like that in the game, in the business, at least for me, you know, for you know, yeah. some of these young guys coming up who are like, you know, in their early twenties, uh, they'll come to me at shows and they'll be like, Hey, you know, I was watching you when I was like 10, you know, which trips me out. Cause it's, you know, it, it's like, just, I understand that. You know what I mean? It's everything that we just talked about for me coming to business. And it, it you know, kind of trips you out a little bit. But um, there's definitely a missed opportunity. But, you know, what are you going to do? Like I said, I mean, maybe I was in line potentially for, for a world title. I don't know for sure. I know definitely for a tag title and an IC t- title. But uh, unfortunately, none of that happened for various circumstances. Who were you going to beat for the IC title? Uh, well, I think, see... The only thing I know that I think the title was, I forgot who was the champion, but I remember the night because it was in Las Vegas and there was a four way intercontinental title match. Like somebody even watching will probably be able to pick the night. You know, it was a Las Vegas Monday Night Raw and the IC title was decided in a four way. And uh, my buddy, who just recently got me a PlayStation 5, thanks again, uh, Shelton Benjamin ended up winning the belt that night. And, uh, you know, and I think from what I was told, that was supposed to be me, but I had unfortunately gotten myself in the trouble. Mm. And so it didn't happen, but it, it really completely actually made sense when I looked at the situation and, you know, it kind of, when I watched it unfold, it kind of broke my heart to see like, Oh, like that was supposed to be me in that opportunity. And, uh, you know, I completely messed it up. And then it never came back around for you, which is the crazy thing. Like you never had another opportunity later on to win that championship. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. And then, yeah. well, I mean, it was probably, I'm trying to think of how much longer I was in the company. It was probably, you know, not much later. I mean, I ended up getting released and then, you know, eventually rehired again. So yeah, it was, uh, those were a tough few years for me, I think. I mean, when you're a lifelong wrestling fan and you get signed at such a young age, you must be thinking, this is it. I'm going to work here forever. I'm going to retire in the WWE. And obviously they, they had different plans for you. Yeah. But again, I, I, I say that, you know, they had diff- different plans, but like, it's probably a lot of it was brought on by me. You know what I mean? Like, cause I mean, you know, they didn't force me to go out and have the issues I had and fail the, the tests that I did and all that stuff. So, it, you know, it just, it was what it was like I was young and this goes back to what we were talking about, just being, that young and not uh having the maturity and and the lo- different life skills and stuff like that is kind of what led me probably to a lot of uh the bad decisions i was making in that time frame so you know i don't put it on like oh it's a the wwe had a different um idea for me or anything like that i just look at it like man i was young and dumb and unfortunately uh it cost me some opportunities and you know i just have to uh be at peace with that and try to move on and do, and do different things. And some of the things I'm doing now, you know, I mean, you get released, then a few years later, you get brought back and from the outside looking in as a fan, your return felt different. It felt subdued. Did it feel mm-hmm. like that for you? Oh yeah, absolutely. Cause I, I came back and, uh, 
you know, I was on Raw initially, but I mean, I spent a lot of the time on uh, superstars, essentially. So, I mean, you know, when it's a far different when when you're getting a push than when you're not getting a push. So, you know, you can feel that, obviously, you know what I mean? So that's definitely I mean, that was the difference. And but that, you know, that also kind of motivated me to try to become the best in-ring worker I could become, which is what I kind of really strive for in that next one. You even had like a shorter entrance. So I was like, no, the masterpiece has this amazing entrance and they like cut your <laughs> entrance down. Yeah. Yeah, it was like an abbreviated entrance, but that was right from the very get-go, you know what I mean? So it's kind of like, you know, I kind of felt like when I came back, I was kind of, uh, you know, which is kind of on probation, so to speak, a little bit, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. okay, we... Well, we'll give them an opportunity, but we're not complete. You know, these made some bad decisions in the past type of thing. And, right. you know, we're not completely sure if we can, uh, you know, invest in him or give him the ball type of thing. Yeah. It's like when the girlfriend comes back after she's cheated on you, you're like, all right, I'll give you another chance, but not, not completely sure about this. That's what it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, you still like you still do a lot or you still keep in touch a lot with Carlito are you guys is, is that your closest friend in wrestling would you say uh, I'd say so man yeah like he's pretty the only person in the business I talk to on a semi-regular basis almost daily via text and I just spent uh I just came back from hanging out with him over in Houston actually for a good week so uh, there's not many people I could say in the wrestling business or my regular life that I would go and spend a week at their house. So, uh, yeah, he's definitely one of my uh, probably my closest buddy, I'd say. So were you excited to see him back in WWE? Oh, my gosh, man. I mean, I watched his Royal Rumble entrance probably 15 times and, you know, it gave me goosebumps. And, I, you know, when you see a guy come back after a decade. Um, as we all know, I mean, a, a wrestling comeback is not 10 years. A wrestling comeback is usually three, four years. Like that's a long, that's six a long months. time. Yeah. Well, yeah, even six months, but I'm saying like, yeah, it's six months, a year, two years, you know, it's not 10 years. Yeah. So a comeback for a guy like Carly after a 10 year absence, I mean, it would be the same thing if I came back, you know what I mean? At this point, cause I've been out of the company since 2011, which I'd love to, uh, you know, it'd be exciting to come back for a Royal Rumble or something like that, I must say. But, um, you know, going back to Carlito, I mean, to come back after 10 years and um, just knowing everything he's been through, he's, in, you know, comes back in the best shape of his life. And, um, you know, him just me being as close as I am to him, like, yeah, it was really cool, man. And I was just so happy to see uh, all the positive feedback. I mean, I, I, I got a bowl of popcorn and I sat back and I was uh, reading, uh, uh, I was all over Twitter that night, you know, just seeing all the different reactions because I knew everybody, you know, a lot of people hadn't seen Carly on a big stage in a long time. And they didn't really realize like uh, just how like the changes he'd made. And, you know, he's like the bet in the best condition of his life and all that stuff. So it was just funny to see everybody on Twitter kind of reacting and being like, oh, my God, and the different memes that came out and everybody just talking about how jacked he is and all of that. Like, uh, I just thought uh, it was really cool. And I was like, as happy as you could get for another person. You know yeah. what I mean? That, that was it. You know, it was really cool. So, I mean, it's been 10 years for him. It's been 10 years for you. Have, has WWE been in touch with you during this last decade? Uh, no, no. I mean, I, I'm at the point now. I mean, you never say never. Like, you know, I feel like they potentially could reach out again at some point. But, um, you know, I'm kind of at the point where I feel like, uh, you know, at this point now, I feel like I've kind of been exiled to a certain point. And we've seen it happen in the past. I don't know. You know what I mean? I, I like I said, never say never. Like maybe though they could reach out to me potentially for something, but I've just kind of taken it off my uh, list of, you know, just even goals at this point. You know what I mean? Like I'm focusing on like the NWA. I'm focusing on my education and stuff like that. But um you know, it obviously would be an exciting thing, but um, I don't know. When You know, when you haven't been reached out to in that period of time, you just kind of feel like, all right, well, you yeah. know, that's it. And there's still, a, you know, a big chunk of your fans in the audience that know you from your time in TNA. And, you know, I, I think that that was a solid run there. Yeah. Well, yeah, it was cool, man. Like, I don't... 
I, I'm glad to have had it and all of that. I don't, I didn't, I don't know. I didn't even factor it honestly until you. <laughs> well, you know why? You know why? Because you know, I, while I was doing Impact, there were so many wrestling fans that would come up to me and still be like, uh, "When are you coming back?" Or, or it's like they hadn't seen it any of the Impact Wrestling stuff. And I, I know that you know, there's a lot of wrestling fans out there, and they, that and they they see Impact. It's just. Uh, you know, I, it's not every day that I had somebody coming up to me and being like, oh, your impact one was awesome. Yeah. But yeah, thank I'm, you. <laughs> you worked under your real name there briefly, which I thought was very interesting. Yeah. You know, I mean, it was just an opportunity that came along. I had been working with Jeff Jarrett before that with the Global Force Wrestling. And then the, you know, impact wrestling thing kind of happened and the merger and Jeff recruited me. And I, I had developed a good relationship with Jeff going back to Rinka King in India. And, uh, you know, Jeff kind of recognized me for kind of the underrated worker that I was. And he uh, he liked that. So uh, and then he would use me from that point on. He used me in Global Force. And then he ended up bringing me into Impact. But then, you know, when Jeff ended up leaving Impact, it felt like, uh, you know, my guy. I kind of lost my guy. And, uh, you know, essentially, you know, my days were kind of numbered there. I thought not, not in like, not as that they had released me, but it just, you know, there were a number of factors, you know what I mean? Like money and stuff like that, that made it, uh, you know, made it not the best situation for me at that point. Yeah. You know, the first person to ever break the master lock was Bobby Lashley. And here yeah. we are, it's coming full circle. Bobby Lashley now uses the master lock. So yeah, you know, it only makes sense, right? Like, if anybody's going to use the full Nelson, the guy who broke it and a guy who's such a physical force like Bobby Lashley, I mean, to me, it's hard to even argue with it. You know what I mean? It just kind of makes sense. But um, it, it was funny, you know, when he first started using it, all the different mentions and stuff like that of people talking about like, <laughs> hey, that's not uh, that's the master lock. That's not the hurt lock and all that type of stuff. And um, I mean, I'd be, I'd be lying if I didn't say it didn't in my mind, create an opportunity for something, you know, even if it was small in terms of, uh, you know, who's got the best full Nelson in professional wrestling, but, um, you know, who knows if anybody even want to see that, but, um, you know, I still think that, you know, if somebody was, it's been, first of all, it's been, again, like we've said, it's been 10 years and usually, usually finishers are recycled well before the 10 year mark. You know what I mean? Like we were talking about Carlito a minute ago, you know, his backstabber was recycled, not even what three or four years later with uh, Alberto Del Rio. So, I mean, you know, for nobody to use the full Nelson for 10 years is, you know, it's a pretty long time. And, you know, the guy who broke it, you know, guy that big, I mean, it just, it kind of makes sense, but uh, totally you know, maybe, sense. but I do see money in a master lock. <laughs> Master lock right. versus hurt lock. I think that the master lock versus the hurt lock makes perfect sense. Yeah. yeah. Have you talked well, to Bobby since? Uh, you know, we follow each other on Instagram and um, I don't think I've seen him since he's been in WWE, but like, you know, we hung out at Impact Wrestling and stuff. So, uh, you know, I've known Bobby since Louisville. So, OVW. So, I mean, you know, Bobby's someone I've known in this business for a long time. So, I mean, uh, you know, people ask me if Bobby asked me for permission to use the lock. And I, you know, I, I remember I, I responded to somebody on Twitter and said, no, and they made this big thing or somebody said, Oh, does he have to? And I'm like, no, that's not what I was getting at. No, he doesn't have to ask me for permission. Of course not. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, uh, again, like Bobby essentially is a guy I've known in this business for so long. And, uh, you know, to me, it only makes sense. So, uh, you know, he, he wouldn't have to ask me. That's not a thing. And, um, you know, I'm just, I'm glad to see guys like Bobby Lashley and Drew McIntyre doing as well as they, they are. Cause, uh, you know, Drew's another guy for me. I've always known Drew's ability. Like I had some of the best matches of my career with him back in 2011. This is when he wasn't being pushed or anything. I just saw the talent he had and the ability he had. So for me, uh, you know, I like seeing the like those two guys going at it, you know, and, and you know, and the WrestleMania and all of that. Are you still as big of a wrestling fan now that you were when you grew up? No, I don't. I don't think I'll ever like I don't I don't think I'll ever be able to duplicate that because now it's it's different. You know, what I mean, it's what I do for work. But like, I will say that, um, you know, even through the pandemic, I found myself on a, on many occasions uh 
you know, I'll, when I go through YouTube, I'll seek out um, old professional wrestling and watch it. You know what I mean? And, you know, I've become a fan of a, a lot of the various podcasts, including yourself and, you know, something to wrestle is always an interesting listen. Jim Cornette, of course. But um, I don't know. It's a, it's a tough question to ask. Like, you no, know, I don't follow Raw every week, like the you know, everything that's going on now. I don't follow it religiously. I see what's going on and I, you know, I see it through various outlets, whether it's YouTube, Instagram or whatever. But um, my real wrestling fandom is anything from 1998 and before that, you know what I mean? It's mm. that whole time frame of wrestling. So I'll go back and I'll watch various stuff. You know, like the other day I was watching Hot Rod, Roddy, Roddy Piper and Brett the Hitman Hart from, uh, you know, WrestleMania. I think it was WrestleMania 8. You know oh, what I mean? Man. So. Yeah, like that, that's the stuff I like to watch and, um, you know, as kind of my, you know, in my leisure time, so to speak. Or even, you know, my favorite couple of years of professional wrestling was uh, 1997 leading into 1998 because you had, you know, the Monday Night Wars, you had heel Bret the Hitman Hart doing the Canadian thing, which was, to my vision, or my opinion, the most awesome version of Bret. You had Sean uh transit transitioning into a heel you had stone cold transitioning in the stone cold just so many different things going off that were laying the groundwork for now eventually the attitude era which was the wrestling boom and um so for me those were the two years i hold you know nearest and dearest to my heart yeah do you think about life after wrestling like you and i are the same age do you think about life after wrestling uh, yeah, now I do, you know, uh, because of, uh, like you said, my age and, you know, a lot of that is why I'm working on, you know, education and stuff like that now, because, uh, yeah, I'm 38 years old. So, I mean, uh, I might still be in good shape and stuff like that, but, uh, you know, I've got to start thinking of, uh, other things to do with myself, you know what I mean? Cause I mean, you know, we all, you know, most of us plan to try to live a long, fulfilling life. So you can't just stop it with, even if you've, made your living and stuff and you're doing doing great you don't want to just stop you know with that you know what i mean you want to be a productive person so um for me a lot of that is you know the education and the various things i'm doing there but it's also uh in terms of pro wrestling it's looking at the potential of you know what else can i do in pro wrestling and like one of the things i've thought about more recently is um producing which is you know like you know um you know they used to call them agents of professional wrestling but a producer is uh you know, kind of the third brain in a match. It's the person who essentially, you, you know, two guys will bounce their ideas off of. It's the guy that also will give the two participants their outcome and their time and all that. But, um, you know, I love the creative process. I like the part when, you know, I'm getting together with my opponent and I'm talking it out with him. And I like having that producer in there to bounce, hey, you know, we'll come up with some ideas, but then we're like, hey, what do, you, what do you think of this? You know what I mean? Or how can this be improved? And to me, that that's a part of the business I've come to understand a lot better throughout the uh, kind of second half of my career, the kind of the storytelling aspect, the selling aspect, you know, all the little things that break, you know, that break up to make a, uh, a good match. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's the stuff I've kind of been looking at more lately or kind of opened my, uh, open my mind to, and, you know, eventually maybe that's something that I can do uh, to be, you know, to contribute to the business and still, uh, potentially make a living in the business. I mean, if you talk about education, you're getting a your GED, are you then looking ahead to, do you want to get a college degree? Well, I mean, I've looked at college courses, but there hasn't been anything specifically that has stood out yet. So I'm starting at with the GED, um, and I, you know, if anything, I'd like, you know, another thing I've been looking into is a lot like kind of what you're doing in terms of, uh, you know, the podcasting, broadcasting, sports broadcasting, stuff like that. You know, I do a Lakers Nation podcast, um, which uh, gets a ton of viewers, not by, they're not Chris Masters people either. I mean, these are just Laker fans. Uh, you know, the Lakers Nation um, platform is a big platform with a lot of followers. It's like the, it's the fan site for Lakers. And, uh, so that's been a fun, really fun thing to do for me because it's given me like a lot of my followers now aren't just wrestling people. They're Lakers, Laker fans. And uh, that's something I'm really passionate about. Like I love basketball. I love uh, the NBA. I love, you know, sports in general, but um, so, you know, that's been kind of a fun thing to do in, in order to kind of uh, 
you know, get some experience doing that. It's almost been to me, it's felt like an internship because uh, it's a place where I can um, be a co-host to my, you know, my, my, the host, which is Trevor Lane. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people watching and, you know, I have got to discuss something that isn't professional wrestling, even it's yeah. basketball. And, but it's fun because I truly love it and I believe purple and gold. So it's, it's not work. It's fun. I've been in LA since last summer and I will say one thing about LA is there's not a lot of sports fans here. So it's so exciting hearing that you're like a die hard Lakers fan and anyone that follows you on social media saw like when Kobe passed away, you were right there. You were at Staples center. You were there for the Memorial. Like I feel like in a way, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it, it felt like you were losing a family member. Oh man. Yeah. It was tough, man. I, I couldn't even believe it. You know, when I had to have my girlfriend at the time, even read the headline to me when I, cause once I knew it was real, I don't know. I was so messed up about it and didn't know what to do with myself. And I did what a lot of people did. I just drove to Staples Center, drove right to Staples Center and just, you know, we all just stood out there and mourned, man. I mean, to me, I've told people this before for Los Angeles, it was like if there was a true, if there was a real Batman, it was the it was the equivalent of Gotham City losing its Batman. That's what Kobe Bryant passing away was to Los Angeles. Like he inspired that city, and he was just he was a special person, man. And yeah, like it, it hit the world, but it really hit Los Angeles hard. And like it was just it was a tough year for that stuff, man, because not only you know Kobe, but then you know the Shad Gaspar thing happened, and that. I mean, those two tragedies, I mean, it was so weird because they both hurt so bad, but like, it was weird because I personally knew Shaq, you know what I mean? Yeah. So that you can understand, like, I didn't personally know Kobe, but Kobe is one of my all time most, uh, you know, sports heroes or inspirations or muses or whatever you would want to call that. So, you know, those two tragedies amongst uh, various others, I mean, obviously it was a tough year for that, all of that, but, um, you know, it was tough. It was, you know, the Kobe and Chad thing felt like just two tragedies, two of the worst tragedies you could ever, um, ever imagine in a lifetime. You know, you were close. You were close to Shad. Like you're both LA guys too. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, Shad had moved to LA. Shad wasn't yeah. an LA guy originally. I had met Shad in OVW again, so I'd known him since the very beginning of this whole wrestling journey. And he eventually moved to Los Angeles, maybe, I don't know if it was like 2015, something like that, 2014. But I'll tell you what, man, there wasn't a guy I've ever seen move to Los Angeles and get over the way Shad did. Just for, you know, he would be, he used to drive me crazy because he'd be at Gold's Gym Venice literally every time I went there, Shad would be there. And I'd just be like, what is going on, man? Are you living here or what? Like, what is this? Is this some 20 hour workout I don't know about that I need to start? So, um, but um, yeah, but Shad really developed a lot of love in that whole community, man. Like everybody in Gold's Gym Venice, man, the turnout that he had when he passed at the beach and, you know, from that and then Arnold Schwarzenegger going to his memorial at Gold's Venice and posting a picture about it. I mean, it was just, it was so Shad Gaspar to kind of go out in such spectacular fashion the way he did, you know, to be such a hero and for so many people, uh, you know, we, we made a lot of jokes about it. And we just, we, we found it so funny that Chad, knowing his personality, the way we all did, would go out in a way that like, I mean, I hope he gets that um, Hall of Fame, you know, that warrior. The warrior award. You know I mean, like, yeah. Like, I know it didn't happen for him this year, but I still think Chad needs to be a contender for that. I know that they, you know, put Titus O'Neil in that spot, but, uh, and, and it sounds like he was very deserving of that, but, uh, you know, I'd like to see Shad, even if it's next year, still be recognized because I mean, just what he did, man, for his son, it was just such a heroic act, man. And just such a, I don't know. It was just crazy. You know, and I lived the thing about that, that was so crazy is I was living in Marina del Rey and uh, that is literally, I mean, it's basically three blocks east of where he drowned. So, I mean, I was just every day that we had discovered his body. I mean, I, it just, you know, this feeling in your stomach of just being kind of sick, just knowing that your 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 boy is out there and they can't find him. So, um, yeah, uh, some tough stuff to look back on, man. <laughs> yeah, that's the place. I dropped you off at of that place in Marina del Rey, right? Yeah. Yeah, you did. Yep, that's yep. That was uh, 
I like that community over there. It was nice. Yeah, that was Miss cool. It. I was <laughs> I was blown away that when we got to Texas, we were hungry, we needed to eat. There's an in and out across the street from the hotel, and a guy that looks like you eats in and out. This was mind blowing to me. <laughs> hey, I'm a California guy, man. Like we live, we love in and out. That's one thing about us. And uh, I think most people who come to California, I mean, one of the questions you always ask is, like, "Did you get some in and out? Did you go by in and out?" And uh, you know. I don't want to go into a whole thing on in and out but uh, you know, a lot of people, it's funny with in and out because you'll have people who swear by it and then some people who feel like it's overrated. Yeah. You know what I mean? So It's either in and out or Whataburger. And then there's a bunch of people that are like, no, Five Guys is the best. Uh, exactly, exactly. It is that. And uh, I don't know, for me, in and outs just got the freshest, like, you know, it's not that they do anything particularly um, innovative. It's just all their stuff is fresh to death. I mean, that's why it's a West Coast company. If you ever watch a documentary on In-N-Out, you'll have a lot of respect for kind of what they do in terms of paying their employees and the, the, the freshness of their products and not compromising that freshness by expanding too much. So uh, it's an awesome company, and I love the burgers, man. Those double doubles, you can't. I guess to me, I'm just more. Well, go ahead. I'm just blown away that you can, you know, look like you look and eat fast food. Well, no, you can't. That's the thing. I, you know, people always say that, like, you can't do in and out every day. But I mean, there are points in time, you know, where you just got to say F it. And you're like, you know, I'm going to, you know, that was an circumstance where in and out was the best option available. So I'm going to take it. You know what I mean? Like, I can live with the fact, me personally, if I eat in and out like once a week, you know, that's not a big thing for me. Like, you know what I mean? Like, as a matter of fact, you know, usually, my goal on a weekly basis is, you know, because at this point, I usually work weekends, uh, you know, when there isn't a pandemic, obviously. Sure. And so uh, my whole goal is Monday through Friday to get in all of my workouts and try to eat as good as possible so that on the weekend I can be allowed. Not only do I ha not have to train on Saturday and Sunday, but I can also if, you know, when I go to the various places to wrestle, I can kind of. Uh, you know, I can eat a little more freely. Like I can go to in and out burger with you because I know that, you know, for the whole week I've been at least, you know, for the most part, I haven't been eating fried food and stuff like that. Yeah. It's, uh, it's encouraging for me to think about that. Uh, <laughs> Once a week. Okay. Once a week. I like pizza a lot. So this makes me feel good. So as the world's <laughs> starting to open up a little bit more, you're open for bookings. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and things have started to pick up a little bit already, which is nice. I mean, I don't know about you, but I've just been hoping that since, <laughs> since this whole pandemic has gone down, you know, I've just been hoping that we are going to come out of it and the economy starts roaring and everybody's working again. And there's a lot of pent up demand for, you know, just various things, you know, like people want to get, you know, get the engine going, the, the engine of the economy. So I mean, then that translates to everything. So, you know, it's nice to see pro wrestling kind of going on a little bit with NWA uh, kind of uh, opening doors again. And we're obviously doing that. And then just working uh, various shows, uh, being the Florida show I just did. I'm going to uh, be in a couple of weeks. I'll be in uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana for a show working against my old buddy Carlito. And then, uh, you know, even uh, Miami at the uh, next month. So, uh it's nice to see that because, I mean, again, we were coming from a place where, man, I mean, I've never had such an, a wide open calendar in, uh, you know, since I started wrestling. But, I mean, that was – if you weren't a WWE wrestler or an yeah. AEW wrestler, that was pretty much everybody, man. I mean, yeah. you know, we've all, been, we've all been hit by this pandemic to some extent. You know what I mean? Some more than others, but I think everybody's been hit to some extent. So is the best way for people to find you on Twitter or Instagram? Yeah, yeah. For bookings, you know, I'm uh, on Instagram. It's Chris Masters 310 on Twitter, even though uh, you've been trying to get me to switch it. It's at Chris Adonis. But, uh, you know, and then I obviously do a lot of my bookings through email, too, which is masterpiece83 at gmail.com. But yeah, anybody who's, uh, you know, got a show lined up or anything uh, on the horizon for, uh, you know, for the year 2021 here, uh, feel free to reach out because I am taking bookings. Let's get back to work. America. Yeah. Book Chris <laughs> Masters for the Master Lock Challenge. That's what we should do. Oh, yeah, because that's an easy payday. <laughs> whenever, <laughs> uh, it's funny, whenever anybody books me for a Master Lock Challenge, I'm like, really? That's it? 
And you're like, I don't have to <laughs> wrestle. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Right. It comes in handy. I'm so happy to have you back on the show, Chris. Thank you so much. Oh yeah, man. It's been great to uh, be on with you again. And uh, I just hope that I can be physically back in Los Angeles soon so we can hang out and maybe actually do one of these interviews in person. Cause I would, let's awesome. do it. What are, what are you waiting for? Get out here. Well, I'm waiting for LA to open back up, man. But I, I heard we got the news that I think yesterday that uh, you guys are opening up June 15th. So uh, I might have to start looking at this more seriously. Yeah, the governor just tweeted that if things keep going the way they are, that the state will be fully open June 15th. Yeah, that's And amazing. California is so locked down with all of their rules. So if California says June 15th, this is great news for everybody. Yeah, well, that's the part that shocked me when I heard it, because I know L.A. has been a lot more conservative or California has been more conservative with uh, the lockdown. And then I'm here in Michigan now and, and, you know, the numbers are going up here. So it's kind of one of those things. It seems like a lot of touch. I'm just hoping with L.A. or California in general that once it's open, it's able to stay open and wow. we don't have this. Because, you know, this thing where it's open and then, oh, wait a minute, numbers are going up type of thing. But um you know, hopefully enough Americans get vaccinated. And I don't know how you feel about that, but I feel like I'm at a point. I know, see, I know there's a lot of, and this is a whole other topic. We won't go into it, but I know there's a lot of anti-vaxxers out there. But for me personally, I know that I'm going to have to get it if I want to work in some of these countries. So it's just yes. kind of a non-choice. So I'm, I'm kind of anxious to get it because then it just means I can go everywhere I need to go. Yeah. I end every interview, Chris, by talking about gratitude, which is such an important thing in my own life. So what are three things in your life that you're grateful for right now? Uh, three things I'm grateful for. I'm grateful for my health. I'm grateful for the opportunity of NWA. And I'm also grateful for the drive I have at this point in my life to do you know, all these various things, whether it be the wrestling, the education, just, you know, just, you know, to diversify my portfolio and try different things and be enthusiastic about, you know, not just wrestling. That That's always been one of the things for me. Wrestling has been the only thing I've been enthusiastic about in my life. So developing, that's always going to be there. Developing enthusiasm for other things has been um, an important thing for me. And I think I've gotten to that point. I love it. Chris, thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Chris.